Chapter 23, Evan Donnelly. I'm a lousy friend. I focus my light on Jason's unhappy features. How do you figure that? We're walking through the woods in the middle of the night. It'll be a miracle if we don't trip on something and faceplant. All because of what good friends we are. Sure, Jason ducks under a low-hanging branch. CJ was in trouble and we were too wrapped up in the fort to even notice. All we did was tell him what a great stepfather he's got. He must have loved that. The two of us are making our way through the darkness along the main trail. We just left the fort three hours ago. CJ stayed behind, supposedly, to finish up a Madden season he was in the middle of. Our plan is to go back at 10 and catch him still there. Then he won't be able to deny that he's living at the fort, and he'll have to let us help him. It's not going to be fun, but we have to make it happen. Fine, we blew it, I admit. We believe CJ's stories about his death to fires. We thought Marcus was great because he bought great stuff. We were oblivious, but now we know better. That's got to count for something. I hope you guys are counting steps, comes Mitchell's voice from Jason's phone. Yeah, sure we are. Jason grins into the screen where Mitchell appears on FaceTime. I don't hear any numbers, Mitchell warns. I'm counting in my head, Jason retorts. Right now, I'm up to 1,313. That's not funny, Mitchell storms. Yeah. If you were here instead of sitting at home, I remind him, you could do the counting yourself. I'm too sick. Not half as sick as I am of hearing how sick you are, Jason retorts, his words booming through the silence of the woods. Up ahead, another light flashes between the tree trunks. That you guys? Comes Ricky's voice. Over here, I call. Ricky falls in beside us, and we continue until we're standing by the trap door, wishing we were pretty much anywhere else. No one's looking forward to the conversation that's ahead. Ricky seems to read my mind. He'll thank us. No, he won't, comes Mitchell's voice. He's going to be mad. Well, here goes nothing. Jason throws open the hatch, and we start down the ladder with me in the lead. CJ's standing in the kitchen area, emptying a can of Dinty Moore beef stew into a saucepan on the hot plate. And he looks startled. What are you guys doing here? The real question, Mitchell pipes up from the phone, is what are you doing here? Oh, hey, Mitch, CJ waves at the screen. You feeling better? Don't change the subject, Mitchell snaps back. Frowning, CJ regards us from face to face to face. What's this about? The silence is so intense that the sound of the air circulating pump feels like it's roaring inside my head. I'm actually waiting for Ricky to speak up since he's the one who got us started down this uncomfortable road. But it hits me that it's not Ricky's place. We're the ones who grew up with CJ. We've known him forever. We owe him this tricky conversation, no matter how awful it's shaping up to be. Listen, man, I begin, we know. We know your cuts and bruises don't come from death to fires. We know Marcus has been hurting you, and we know you've been sleeping at the fort. Now, I'm not sure what I expected him to do, but this isn't it. He, he laughs. <laughs> you guys are bugging. Why are you here now, I challenge. A Madden season doesn't take three hours. He shrugs. Yeah, time flies when you're having fun, and then I got hungry. Didn't realize how late it was. I'll head to home as soon as I eat. Now, whatever is going on, it hasn't affected his appetite. He slurps down that stew like a starving shark, in spite of the fact that the rest of us are standing around and staring at him. You guys are idiots, he tells us between bites. What, you're going to walk me home to make sure I get there? I don't back down. Sounds like a good idea. I agree, Ricky adds. CJ's eyes flash. Oh, the magnet school kid agrees, so it must be the smart move. I'm coming too, Jason says grimly. We're all going with you. Make sure you wash the dishes first, Mitchell puts in from the phone. It breaks the ice a little, but not much. We've made it this far. We can't let CJ off the hook. I think of the hints, the clues, the chunks of undeniable evidence that must have been staring us in the face for so long. 
How oblivious we must have been. CJ's sour look when the rest of us were the Marcus fan club. It never made sense, yet we never wondered why. And the death defiers. CJ wasn't a wild man or a risk taker in elementary school. Not until Marcus joined his family. Why didn't we question this dangerous change in a kid that we saw every day? We nagged him about the stunts themselves, but it didn't occur to us to investigate the purpose behind them. It took Ricky to put the pieces together. And now it's out there. As much as we don't want it to believe, believe it, we know it's true. We failed our friend, but not anymore. We've got to rescue him whether he wants to be rescued or not. CJ is sarcastic as he shrugs into his jacket. Yeah, thanks a lot, you guys, for believing me. I thought you were my friends. We are your friends, I insist, and that's why we're here. You could have fooled me. Friends trust each other. He climbs up the ladder and out the trap door. We follow him, making sure to turn off the power and camouflage the entrance to the fort, and we walk behind him in silence except for the whining and complaining coming over Jason's phone. You left that dirty pot in the sink, Mitchell accuses. You're ruining the whole fort. By the lights of our phones, we navigate out of the woods and into CJ's neighborhood. He wheels to face us. All right, guys, this has gone far enough. I think I can make it home from here without a platoon of bodyguards. We don't give him an argument, but when he turns and walks on, we're right there with him. As we press on toward CJ's street, I catch a nervous glance from Jason. I understand perfectly. What if we're wrong? We trusted Ricky because he's smart, but he's not really one of us. If all this is Ricky misreading things and jumping to conclusions, then we're making a terrible mistake. And it goes without saying that we'll look like jerks. But we'll feel a lot worse than if CJ never forgives us. Or we'll feel a lot worse than that if CJ never forgives us. Being 99% sure isn't the same as 100. Even Ricky looks a little uncertain as CJ approaches his block. And then it happens. As he's about to make the turn, CJ stops dead in his tracks. And he doesn't fall exactly. It's more like he collapses onto the sidewalk, sitting down on the pavement, hugging his knees. And we all see it. But to Mitchell, who's connected via FaceTime, it must have looked like he just vanished from the screen. Where'd he go? He's here, I supply. He just... My voice cracks a little. Taking a break. I thought I was sure before, but getting confirmation from CJ himself is more powerful than I expected. This is the kind of thing that happens to faceless strangers in books and movies and unhappy newspaper stories. Yeah, it was kind of, it was bad for Luke and me when mom and dad checked out on us, but at least we had Graham and grandpa. CJ isn't that lucky. And the idea that I could have been there for him, I could have supported him, but I didn't even notice it was happening. It's so tragic, so shameful, that I'm paralyzed for a moment. The only thing that snaps me out of it is one thought. It's too late to help him then. I have to help him now. And I get down on one knee. It's okay, man. We got your back. You can't tell anybody, he pleads. He looks up at Jason, especially not Janelle. Her dad can't find out. I don't know, put in Ricky. Maybe a cop is exactly what you need. CJ shakes his head vehemently. No cops. Marcus, I don't know what he'd do to my mom if he thought she called the police. That explains why CJ can't just go for his mom for help. She's a fellow victim. I should have seen that too. You can stay at my place, I offer. You don't have to sleep at the fort. And mine, Jason adds readily. Both of mine. We can ride double on my bike. Yeah, you, you can stay with me too, Mitchell adds. I, I promise I won't cough on you. It brings a slight smile out of CJ. You're not sick. We all want to help, Ricky agrees. I haven't known you as long as these guys, but you could bunk at my house too. My dad's cooking is better than 40-year-old beef stew. It won't work, CJ says sadly. There's no way we can explain to any of your families why I can't live at home. 
If they believe me, they'll call the cops. And if they don't believe me, they'll call Marcus. It's lose-lose. Mean we can't do any anything? Mitchell wails. His words sound extra helpless coming from the speaker of Jason's phone. I put a hand on CJ's shoulder. I'm so sorry, man. I should have seen it. I should have known. Jason squats down beside this. Why didn't you say something, CJ? It's not his fault, I insist. We should have figured it out. CJ shakes his head. I did everything I could to keep it a secret. I, you think it was fun, those death defiers? Throwing myself off bikes and downstairs to explain the bruises that Marcus put on me? You guys were embarrassed to admit that you got scared by those movies we watched, like Piranha and Jaws. But the hardest thing to say out loud is that the real monster lives in your house and you never know when the next attack is going to happen. Now, Ricky has been hanging back from all of this, probably because he's the outsider. And now he kneels beside us. How did you think it was going to get better if you didn't tell anybody? CJ shrugs miserably. Well, at first, I really believed that Marcus might change, and when I gave up on that, I figured all I had to do was get older, bigger, and stronger so I could pre protect myself and my mom. And he sighs, but that takes too long. So this is where we are now. My mother won't leave Marcus, and I won't go back to that house. I know you guys want to help, but I'm just in a place where helping doesn't work. I'm totally out of luck. The fact that no one exclaims, no, you're not, or starts detailing a plan, speaks volumes. Even Ricky, who's normally our idea guy, has nothing to offer. CJ's right. We can't solve this for him. There are problems that are beyond the power of kids. Somehow, though, we have to get him through this. We're silent for a long time, that old bear on the pavement, and CJ's the first to speak. Let's go home. Wordlessly, we all get up and start walking. No one has to ask about our destination.